very much. Hello all. Good afternoon. How is everyone? Nods. Good, good, good. Happiness. So I'm trying to work out whether we're in the, the slump of lunch and how phonetic I need to jump around or whether we can just uh, work our way through. Everyone looks excited, interested, intellectual. This is a good, a good start. Um, so, yeah, so I'm from Ardman. Um, we're based uh, just over the river. Obviously, very proud to uh, have people coming to our city and obviously proud to, um, uh, to be around and involved in such a massive thing. I know many people are thanking the guys from Opposable, but then we just add to that. Oh man, the font. I, I've been having this little debate for the last few minutes because, as a graphic, like creative director at heart, I d I've got this fear of the font not being right, and now the font's not right. And we tried it. <laughs> Guys, come on, man. I've, this has happened once before, and I spend the whole time then cringing every time we change slides. At least it'll be funnier for you, so you can enjoy it. Um, uh, but yeah, so at um, uh, Ardman, we do, you know, the thing a lot of people know us for tends to be pushing clay around really slowly and taking pictures of it. Um, but we do do a lot more than that. We do a lot more than you think. Um, uh, there's the, there is the feature films with the Wallace and Gromit. There's the TV series with Sean the Sheep. We also make a load, a load, a load of short stuff. We're a big animation house anyway. It's so about 80 short films, adverts. I don't know what you call them these days. YouTube videos. They're kind of all those things now uh, come out for, uh, every year. I'm the creative director of the interactive team. So for 10 years, we've been trying to work out how to take uh, these stories and the worlds that we're creating and find interactive homes for them. And then there's all the blurry bits that happen in between. Um, so 4D cinema rides, uh, roller coasters. We'll kind of do anything we can get our hands on. Um, but the thing that stops all of these many different people with uh, different personalities, different industries, different um, kind of skill bases, different ways of working, the thing that keeps us all together uh, is uh, like a kind of our, our mission statement and our, our purpose for being around is that we create characters that people fall in love with and we tell stories um, that affect people, that change them in s some way. And it's that second bit, this story kind of telling, which I think is probably true in almost every form of media and in many people's lives. And I know the guys I mentioned the story said many times there about museums and you know, like our ability, our desire to tell narratives is such a human thing and it's such a powerful thing um, because it feels like it's the thing that encodes emotions. So it's the thing we use to, emotion, to, to transfer emotions from one person to another or one to many. Um, and so it's this connection of emotion and storytelling which obviously drew Ardman into doing this. We want to tell stories that affect people and along comes this bit of technology which seems like it is very effective at being emotional. And so that's kind of what, what drove us. Let's do this. It's also we're a bunch of massive geeks and we love telling stories like storytelling geeks and uh, gaming geeks and uh, general tech geeks. So we're obviously excited to play with that as well. Um, and what's been so lovely about it as a process, we've been doing it for about two years now, is that it's one of the, I wouldn't say few formats, but it's, de it's very, very apparent that every part of our company needs to come together to make these things happen. So, yeah, from uh, developers and game designers and storytellers and CG artists, and all, all of us sit in a room and do it. So that also makes it a nice thing. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, the kind of the much cited. I don't know if, if anyone's playing VR bingo. I imagine Chris Milk will be on there because of his uh, TED talk a few years ago and this mention of the empathy machine, um, which is true. I believe in that. I do genuinely believe this thing has a very powerful. Uh, ability to um, to create empathy, to create emotions. Um, but if it is a machine, it's a really bloody complex machine with like thousands of buttons and no manual, and no one quite knows what they're doing with it yet. And so I, I think this is what I try to make this talk. Um, uh, and is we've pressed a few of the buttons. And we thought we'd come and say, look, we did this, we kind of learned this. Um, because right now, it's all about sharing information and working out uh, how we get, wor how, how these new techniques and new things will be done. So that, that's kind of what I'm here. Like, how do we do this? And, and how can you use that to connect with audiences, to, to make them feel something? Um, so I'm going to talk about two projects. No. No. Ah, there we are, good. Um, so uh, the two projects that we've done recently, I'd love to talk about a few more that are in the making, but they're not quite yet. So, so this is the last time I'm going to do this talk, and next time I come back, we're, we're going to have a few more projects on there. Um, but one of them is called We Wait. Uh, it's the, it tells the story of a family of Syrian refugees um, that are sat on the beach waiting to take a journey from uh, Turkey to Greece. Um, it was done with the BBC, with BBC Connected Studio, um, and it kind of had two purposes. The very, very first purpose that formed was we were thinking, well, what's different about VR 
that we can use to to, con to create this empathy. And we thought eye contact is something um, uh, that, that is unique. And so how do we use eye contact in which to deliver uh, a more emotive or control and deliver a more emotive emotional kind of piece of narrative? Um, and, but then within 24 hours, uh, there was all this stuff going on in the news. Um, at the time, it was very kind of homogenized facts and figures about, um, about what was happening uh, with the, I kind of hate the, the term, but the migrant crisis that I had to do the finger thing to prove that I hate it. Um, but that, that thing was going on. And it felt, like, it felt like there was an opportunity, a need, in which to talk about the individual humans that were involved in this thing that had become kind of this overall topic. And from my few experiences I had at the time of VR, it felt like this is something where it is intimate and you get close to it, and therefore the two join together. Um, so this is the first piece we did. I'll, I'll play a quick trailer. We are all tired. They were supposed to be here an hour ago. Maybe they don't come. I should say, because um, it's the one thing I'd hate anyway, uh, it's the one frustration I get when I, and I realize that I haven't told you this, um, it's not fair for me to be frustrated. But the, the, the stories there were all constructed with news correspondents, the BBC news correspondents who led us to be able to speak to people, lots of interviews, podcasts, and kind of we used that body of knowledge in which to construct that story. Um, the second piece, slightly more kind of maybe expectant from Ardman, not quite so heavy, is a piece called Special Delivery. It was one of these spotlight stories. I know the guys from Google mentioned it this morning, um, where they asked a number of uh, different um, clients, different people, different age, um, uh, production companies to build t and test this way of talking. It's not technically VR. I'd call it um, uh, 360 storytelling. I'm going to... It's going to play some music, so I don't know if you mind just keeping, um, as I keep talking, balancing it. Um, but the, uh, um, the uh, you'll notice, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, it's a kind of more a form of 360 storytelling where you're using the phone as a window. But what they're particularly interested in were twofold. One is story and this ability to, to be told in 360, um, but also about breaking their technology. So they're building a, a tool in which to build these stories. And so they went to a number of different studios and said, can you try and make stuff so we can work out how to make it better? Um, this one tells the story of an overzealous um, janitor in a kind of rear windows, the film style block of flats, um, and his um, cat and mouse chase with Father Christmas um, that goes on. But we'll, we'll see a little bit more of them, but I just want to show them that, so when I refer back to them, you know what the hell I'm talking about. Oh, there it is, the fun. So. Um, uh, it really doesn't help as well because they're all overly precocious kind of titles. So now we've got that in this font. Um, but the first one, um, think space, not time, or probably more accurately, um, think space, not just time. You know, storytelling is, in, at its heart, is, has always been a temporal um, process. It, stories have beginning, middle, and end. Um, they travel through time, and the techniques we tend to use are time-based in which to deliver the emotional journey. You say things like journey and arcs and all this stuff that needs to happen over two axes, and so uh, have that time within there. Um, but we're, we're starting to deliver stories in a three-dimensional space, and more important than it just being 3D, because uh, like space has always existed in, in the media we're doing, I think more important is the fact that the audience is choosing where to look. So all of a sudden, we've gone from something where you had this direction to them having agency over the square that they look at. And so the architecture of your space that you're constructing is vital, more important than it ever has been before. And you use that architecture in which to tell stories. Um, so this idea of um, architectural storytelling is not new. Um, I'll get to these guys in a second. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a few, you can read articles about it, there's stuff out there, it's an interesting, there's no loads, not, not loads of great stuff, but this kind of using structure in which to tell architecture is a thing. Um, it's done, you know, it's already done in films. They, uh, every frame is a consideration in the space and the structure. 
Uh, it's definitely done in games, um, the way that they, you have to use the place that you're in in which to deliver narrative. And these guys, Disneyland, Disney World, I think do it exceptionally well. Uh, they have a physical space in which when you come in from the entrance, they curve the ground so that the castle emerges gradually or more gradually. Um, it's kind of there saying, this, you can go here, but actually you journey around. So it's showing you, it's, it's kind of transporting you into this, could be, this is where you're going to go eventually. And the queues systems um, are just epic. You know, they, they, as, at, within the horrible situation of being in a queue, um, we are British, so we quite like it, but outside of that, the horrible situation, they slowly develop the narrative of what you're going into as you go around. And so architecture and storytelling has been connected together. Um, but what's, what was interesting once we start actually trying to look at these techniques and do it ourselves is how certain temporally based, is that the right word? I guess story based kind of techniques transfer into architectural spaces. Um, within um, uh, special delivery, that we ended up using something, I'm kind of suggesting this, but I think it's true. We ended up using something which is uh, mainly known as uh, dramatic irony. So probably many people know story will, um, will appreciate what this is, but for any that don't, it's, it's at its simplest. It's the, pre it's the difference between what an audience member knows and what your protagonist, your heroes know. And that difference is what creates kind of emotional pressure. You get things like bad guys hiding in the room and the heroes coming along. Um, and you're like, no, don't open the door because you know it and the guy doesn't. Or my favorite being romantic um, is you have the uh, lovers, but they haven't told each other they love each other. And then one of them's running across uh, an airport. It's always airports, I don't understand why. And you're like, just tell them you love them. You know, but it, uh, and it's, that, it's these techniques that are used to create emotion. Um, but within this piece, uh, we, we didn't do it through time. We didn't have to do that. Um, in, from your godlike view, you can see both characters, but they haven't seen each other. So actually, what we are doing is creating dramatic irony, but the way you construct it is you look, and you go, and then you look again. And so uh, you're using the architecture and the space in which to construct those same kind of techniques. Um, and then uh, alongside that, uh, in this piece in particular, uh, Tim, the director, so I, didn't, uh, I wasn't involved in this one, just looking over his shoulder and asking lots of questions, but uh, Tim wanted close-ups. He wanted mid-shots. He wanted the ability to have a vista and a space, um, but without wanting to move the player, uh, the player, our audience. It gets very confusing these days, doesn't it, what you call it? I go back for audience, because that generally covers everything. But without wanting to move the audience, um, you had to create opportunity in which, to, and you can't do cuts or... You'll see, we tried it and we wait. It's harder to do cuts. Um, so you need to create opportunities for close-ups and far away and mid. So all of the architecture was considered and built to allow people to move around it and give you those, those framings so the director could still get what they wanted out of it. Um, but once you, once you have this idea and you've got to start thinking three-dimensionally, we were trying to work out how do you actually get... How do you build this? How do you think it through? Uh, and being Ardman, probably, but I think uh, I'm a great believer of this, and I'm sure many people do it as well, is about the physicality, starting to use real things to think three-dimensionally to build up um, are the equivalent of our storyboards. So this one here from Special Delivery again uh, was uh, what Andy, um, Andy, Andy Davis. No, I'm just calling him something. To, I've, I've forgotten his name. I'm sorry, Andy. I've forgotten your last name. It's going to be really embarrassing when I go back to Ardman and he watches this talk. Um, but uh, Andy, who's, who's a miraculous... Um, uh, a storyboard artist was trying to get his head around how does he do this and eventually out came the cardboard um, uh, kind of craft knife and this set was built and then alongside it he started then using post-it notes that could be replaced on the windows in which to create storyboards and out of this came the framework that was around it. Um, they spent quite a lot of time with uh, puppets on pens recording it on phone to try and get a sense um, but that ability to adjust, change, tweak, and, and very quickly and very cheaply uh, is vital. I mean, there's some tools now coming with the tilt brush and medium and um, quill that are going to allow us to do it virtually as well at the same time. Um, but this is what we know, and there's many people that spent a long time making stuff, so use those skills. Um, that was the Google budget. This one's the, uh, my one on the BBC budget. You can see it's slightly <laughs> different. Um, sorry, BBC, you're probably here, aren't you? I'm going to get in trouble. Um, but the... Um, uh, what, um, so uh, big box, of, you know, you can do it with anything. Big box of Lego. This was the first draft of the area in which we were going to set. We wait on the beach. Um, this is a slightly embarrassing video of me trying to lay out how um, how we could place all of our um, uh, people within the scene and spread them about the place. 
uh, you'll see there's a few awkward moments where I have to like move the set and my fingers come into place. You'll also notice my very high quality um, clay work, the reason I'm at Ardman. Um, uh, but, um, but it worked, and you know, I think after this, watching this one, we realized you had a massive clump of people over there, whereas when you're looking top down, they all look spread, away, uh, spread around, so we kind of adjusted and changed um, uh, quite a lot to, uh, until we got that right. Um, and then the final piece was that this, uh, we wanted to create cuts. I mentioned the, the difficulty in making cuts, but we really wanted to, we wanted the people that were sat on the beach to start telling their stories and then you be transferred into their memories, their memories to paint around you so that not only did you hear story of these characters, um, but you also got an opportunity to, to use the kind of physicality of, of VR and, and demonstrate some of that. Um, but uh, this is where we started thinking about it, and again, if the, the VR bingo, I imagine people have talked about immersive theater in at least a few of the talks, um, because this was the moment where, we, where the word cinematic that we'd used quite a lot, we want these cinematic moments, we threw away and we started using theatrical, um, because actually theatrical process was a lot closer to the development of this than any kind of cinematic process, or at least many of the cinematic processes. Um, we were worrying about set changes, about dislocation, about the distance you were from the audience, um, from, the, from the actor. Uh, all of these things were quite physical needs that you couldn't really just throw away because, because it is quite a physical experience. Um, and in this case, what we wanted to do is, you, these are our main characters. <laughs> And we wanted them to, um, to be able to always stay in the same place and the world around you change. There's a few other things, like a guy over here smoking a cigarette turns into the light of a boy in the sea and um, other pieces. But we, we accomplished this with lots and bits of tracing paper and drawing stuff on top of each other. So there's much that can be done before we get into the computer. Yeah, there it is again. Um, utilize both direction and misdirection. So... So audio uh, is uh, it's obviously sh is much, again, much cited over and over again. People talk about how important audio is. Um, I agree, and I think we probably didn't, either didn't get an opportunity or didn't qu we can definitely do it better. Um, but also, there's many people that can talk about how to do that. So I'm not really going to go into that, because I think all we did is learn that we weren't doing it good enough, and we're going to come back and do it again. Um, with the spotlight stories, audio is kind of irrelevant because a lot of people either couldn't hear or wouldn't put headphones in when they were doing that. Um, with We Waits, we, we used the internal spatializer and tried to do that, but we've, we've kind of grown up a bit now and are starting to realize about the, the power of some of the softwares that are, that's out there and tr trying to get better at it. So, so definitely, that was something I think we could do better, so definitely make sure you invest in um, sound and audio. Um, but the thing we did, I think we did, do quite well in and learn stuff uh, about was using light. So uh, a lot of these journeys take place at night, um, which means that the, a lot of our construction and the way we wanted to present it involved pools of light and using light. And so when we were trying to understand how to get people's attention, um, we, we ended up using light. Now, there's a suggestion, there's this kind of holy grail somewhere in the future where where we create a kind of story simulation, so the ability for this world that you're in to generate the story around you, which is so rich that no matter which direction you look in, you just, the story progresses. Um, but I think it's like, it's a holy grail that can never be achieved. Ultimately, we end up focusing our, our kind of attention down to heroes and protagonists, which then means you have to get them to look at it. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, no matter how much we want to build the story all around you, you still end up needing to use this sense of direction to get people to the point that you want at the right time to deliver some of the narrative, I, th I think. I haven't quite worked out the magic way of, of not using that technique. Um, so in this case, uh, one of the way things we used to direct you was this light, the torch, um, which shines over your shoulder so that you can see something, that's, uh, so that someone else notices behind you and starts shining this light. And that was to force people into the awkward positions that they wouldn't normally look in and kind of look over there shoulder. Um, but similarly, we realized, um, partly because it's a very expensive effect, this doesn't sound, this, this doesn't, I, I like to make sure that everything would be dramatic and for the right creative reasons, but now I'm admitting that as well, um, the technical things that happen. Um, but uh, it's quite an expensive effect, so we didn't have much choice but to reuse it as many places we could. But it came out really good. The, uh, the other thing we wanted was misdirection, to try and do the smoke and mirrors, a bit like in theater, where you get to shift um, people from one scene to another. We wanted to, uh, to, to kind of take your attention away and shift the set underneath you so you're left back there. It was, again, technical. There was an issue around um, 
uh, we, we really liked the idea of one world blurring into the other, but because of load times, we actually, because of the, the issues where we had to reload a new scene, we ended up in this problem where we had to go to a complete color, swap the scene around, and then come back out of it again. Um, and so all of those things led us to this idea of the torch. And you'll notice that when the torch goes over your eyes, we fade up um, towards, uh, we did fade up towards white, um, I couldn't see for about four or five days after that. So then um, we, we fade up to a warm yellow, which still makes your eyes kind of shrink and uh, your pupils shrink, and most people close their eyes. And then you can swap the scene out underneath them, and as their eyes are readjusting, you're kind of, you hopefully have covered over some of your seams, was the, the idea behind it. Um, so yeah, so that use of direction to get people in places and misdirection, um, I think worked quite well with light, and we kind of messed up a little bit with sound. Um, so use social engineering. Um, this is was one of the more interesting ones that I uh, that I was that I kind of found within the process. So within um, uh, special delivery, we 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 just decided that you were a god, a fly on the wall, that the world was there, but you didn't exist. Um, because we wanted to use eye contact in this piece, we needed you to exist as an audience member. And there's many talks and interesting things going on all over the place around this where, uh, in terms of narrative and who are you as an audience member. It's probably one of the most interesting things going on right now. So we know that we knew that we needed you to be a, a real person. Um, and, and some interesting things kind of came out the other side of that. Um, the, before I kind of talk about mine, it's probably worth talking about uh, the Oculus Story Studio have done quite a lot of stuff in this, but there's been some interest. So if I merge uh, the mightiness of them with a few of the things we've been trying, it's quite an interesting development. Um, but they, they talked about, I think it was when they were doing, it might, have even, it might have been when they were doing Lost, their very first piece. First thing they noticed is that the, the big robot hand thing, just in case you didn't know, uh, like this, uh, comes along and sniffs you. And at the point at which it sniffs you, you, it, it, they noticed a. It, didn't, it doesn't. It doesn't appear. It doesn't do anything else with you at that point. It just kind of notices that you're there. But from there onwards, people found a greater engagement in the character and spent more time looking at it. And I think there's a similarity going on in this as well. Um, but then you end up with uh, something else like in Henry, where they struggled. Where one of the one of the moments some people, half the team, loved was the fact that when you looked at Henry. He looked up at you. Um, on the flip side, he was meant to be lonely and by himself. So in that case, they kind of caught themselves in a loop where they constructed a story premise which didn't go with, with the situation. Um, and, uh, and I also I have to recite their name for it because I really liked it. They called it the um, uh, Swayze effect, as in Patrick Swayze and Ghost, where if you're there and there's all these people and you're going, listen to me, and, you know, the, when he's a ghost, and no one does. You just feel weird. You feel disconnected from that world. Um, and so one of our biggest missions was connection in this case. And so what we did is a uh, few of the characters talk to you, probably quite an obvious thing, but many of the characters react to the fact that you exist. Um, so the lady on the right, the sister, um, looks at you when you look at her. The character's over in the end. He looks up, notices you, goes back. At the beginning, we started doing tests. It was all about, how am I doing on time? Yeah, Wrap it up. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I got overly excited. Apologies, I was, I was feeling like I might be rambling. Um, so, uh, but yeah, you ended, um, you end up, we ended up in a situation where we, where we started with everyone you looked at burst up and start, and you were, because we wanted to show them. We were like, oh, look, you've done something. Um, you've noticed it. But when you do that with real people, we did it quite a lot in the office, weirding people out. They, um, uh, people don't do that. They just kind of look at you and look back. So in the end, most of the effects in this are really, really subtle, but it does give you a sense of place. And just a, a really short version of, of what that kind of feels like is uh, the social engineering thing, is that when you make a connection with someone, particularly if you start talking to them, it's interesting how the politeness in you makes you feel like you have to continue engaging with them. So using like social norms to, to force people into connecting with your characters was an, was an interesting outcome. And then the final thing is just uh, when I asked Tim about being funny in VR, he said it's really important to be funny um, uh, fast. So um, these were a number of the small kind of humor, uh, humorous things that were going on. He said like, well, this one, for example, is one of the most successful because it, it comes in sm lots of small little chunks. Um, uh, um, uh, slapstick is obviously a great, uh, both a, a, a skill that, and a, a area of comedy that Ardman has, um, but also it's quite physical, so that translated quite well into the space. Um, but when you're trying to deliver a joke, 
uh, people are obviously moving around. So if you're trying to deliver a joke, uh, deliver a joke quickly was, the, um, was, was his example and rule that I should pass on to you guys. So thank you very much. Sorry for running over late. So, and you're probably not allowed to ask me any questions. So. No, no, no.